Stone Brothers Production. Hello and welcome back to the true crime series about serial killers throughout the United States of America. In this episode, we will be talking about Massachusetts serial killers. I know there are many other serial killers in this state, although I chose out the ones I found the most interesting. I just didn't want to make it any longer than I know it will be because these videos take a very long time to produce on top of the research we are both scanning through. I hope to get more continued support from you all, so subscribe, smash that thumbs up button, share the video, and add it to your true crime playlist. This is 6 serial killers in Massachusetts, so let's get right into the video. Number 6 Anthony J. Jackson a.k.a. the Hitchhike Murderer. Jackson preyed on young co-eds who he would find holding up their thumbs for rides in and around the Boston, Massachusetts area. The killer first showed up on September 1972 when he murdered 18-year-old Kathleen Randall. Jackson picked up Randall a week after she was enrolled at Boston University. She was last seen hitchhiking near the university. Unfortunately, her body was found two weeks later in New Hampshire where she was raped and had strangulation marks around her neck. About two days later, Jackson claimed his next victim, 19-year-old Deborah Stevens. Her body was found dumped 50 miles from her home in Lynn, Massachusetts. Stevens was raped and strangled to death like Jackson's first victim. His next victim is 19-year-old Ellen Reich, who is a habitual hitchhiker. She was a sophomore at Emerson College and lived off campus in the Back Bay area. Unfortunately, she went missing on November 8th and was last seen that morning by her roommate. On November 9th, Belen MacArthur found her body while helping a friend, Mary Lee Cobb, with moving furniture from her apartment on Seaver Street. While he was waiting for the moving truck to come back, he looked inside the building and found a closet door that was nailed shut. MacArthur was curious to see what was inside, so he pried the door open and found Reich's body inside. On November 14, 1972, medical examiner George Curtis performed an autopsy on the victim. After a few autopsies, he found that she was killed by strangulation and found two gunshot wounds to the chest and stomach. One bullet was pulled from her vertebrae and he found sperm in the victim's vagina. He found hair on the victim's jeans that didn't match the pubic hair of the victim. Most of the hair found on the victim's clothes was from African American descent. On November 28th, the body of Sandra J. and Ramjian, age 21, was found in Brockton, located in the suburbs of Boston by Waldo Lake. An autopsy showed the same patterns of rape and strangulation marks like the previous victims. Sandra was a college student who had been living in Cambridge, working in Boston as a taxi driver, and went missing a day earlier on November 27th. Her roommate stated she went hitchhiking to visit her parents in East Meadows, New York for a doctor's appointment. On Wednesday night, November 29th, another college student from New York, 22-year-old Demarius Gillespie, disappeared just 34 hours after the discovery of Sandra. After Gillespie disappeared, Lt. Edward Sherry, leader of the Boston Police Homicide Division, stated it was possible the same suspect or suspects could be responsible for all the hitchhiker slangs. Police added to this stating that several other women reported assaults after hitchhiking rides in the university area. Gillespie was last evening leaving her apartment to go to work at her waitress job at the Jazz Workshop in Boston, Massachusetts. Authorities said she told her roommates that she was going to hitch a ride, and her roommates added that she never had a fear of hitchhiking. On December 26, 1972, police officer John Conroy was patrolling in Cambridge when he spotted a suspect in a dark-colored Cadillac waving a young woman walking down the street. He decided to follow the suspect when he drove away, not knowing at the time it was the hitchhike murderer Anthony Jackson. While Officer Conroy was after the suspect, he suddenly drove off at high speed, which was a rookie mistake when he killed up to five or more victims. Later, Cambridge police officer Joseph McSweeney spotted the suspect's vehicle, which was empty, but located Jackson after searching nearby. 
He walked towards the suspect who soon drew out a gun from his black holster, taking a shot at the officer and kept firing his weapon while running down the street. Officer McSweeney retaliated, shooting back at the suspect who dropped to one knee but lost sight of the shooter for two or three minutes. Fortunately, he found him again, laying on the ground with two other police officers beside him, but they lost sight of his gun. His pearl-handed silver-colored gun was found by a man several days later who was working near his arrest location. He was arrested during that time of charges of assault with a deadly weapon, operating a vehicle to endanger, and illegal possession of firearms. On February 3rd, 1973, Jackson was indicted for the murder of Gillespie, and her body was found in a heavily wooded area in Bellarica, strangled to death. During his trial period from 1976 through 1978, he had been indicted on multiple charges of murder, rape, armed assault, and other various charges. Sometime on December 1976, Jackson was convicted for the murder, rape, unarmed robbery, and kidnapping of 23-year-old art teacher Ruth A. Hamilton. For the murder, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole at the Massachusetts Correctional Institute in Walpole. Jackson was only convicted on one or more of his murders of Demarius Gillespie, receiving another life term. Jackson was suspected of killing more than a dozen women because of a metal container filled with hundreds of pornographic images of women, some included his victims. The only reason I know this is that he had a fellow associate, Donald McDonald, who admitted disposing of the container in a river that he had told authorities. Lastly, I want to add that one of Jackson's cold case murder of Kathleen Randolph's physical evidence was reported to have been destroyed. Evidence was believed to have been destroyed by Detective Frank Pazin, who was assigned to the cold case and other murders, but he denied any involvement. Unfortunately, this discovery was not made until the 2000s, but Jackson will still spend the rest of his life in prison. Number 5 Kenneth Harrison, aka The Giggler a serial killer nicknamed The Giggler first showed up in a 911 call on June 16, 1969, around 1.30 a.m. The caller said to the operator, My dear, at the corner of Washington and Needland Street, in a construction site, there will be a man down in the water, dead. The caller ended the conversation with The Giggler as he laughed like a maniac before hanging up the phone. The victim was 31-year-old Joe Breen, who was last seen a day before the phone call on June 15th. He was last seen drinking at the Novelty Bar with Harrison and his friend while playing on the shuffleboard court. Breen's friend left the two to drink together while he was bar hopping in the local area. Once his friend returned to the Novelty Bar to pick him up, he saw the two were gone. He was too late to come back for Breen because the giggler took him out to the back of the bar and smashed his skull in. Harrison left Breen face down in a puddle of nasty water and left the terrifying phone call that I had mentioned earlier. About six months later, on December 26, 1969, nine-year-old Kenneth Martin, who was a third grader at St. Ambrose Elementary School, was last seen near the South Station, which is the city's major transportation hub. Twelve days have gone by and his fate remained a mystery. Fortunately, an anonymous caller contacted the Boston authorities and stated a boy's body could be found in one of the tunnels under the station. It took two days to find Kenneth Martin's body because the South Station was known to be a labyrinth. They found the boy's body stuffed in a canvas sack, choked to death in one of the station's subterranean passageways. Martin's body had a length of twine markings around his neck several times, and there's no sign of a sexual assault. One of the alley workers remembers seeing Martin with Kenneth Harrison, who sometimes lives in one of the many unused offices. Detectives soon find out he was 31 years old and had jumped onto a train to Providence, Rhode Island, the day previously. Boston Police Detective Jack Daly traveled to Providence, and in a lucky coincidence, the investigator spotted Harrison resting at a street corner. Harrison was taken to Boston for interrogation, and on January 7th, he admitted to killing 9-year-old Martin. He then claimed to have no memory of the event because being drunk out of his mind. 
Harrison was just chatting with the boy in the abandoned office when he lost his mind with the urge to kill. Based off his story, he added that he woke up the following morning next to Martin's corpse where he stashed the body. Harrison then said to Boston Police Detective Edward Sherry, As long as I am here, I may as well tell you about a few more murders. He confessed to killing four people from 1967 to 1969, and all were different in ages attacked at random. His first victim was a six-year-old girl who accepted a ride from Harrison while he was a taxi driver in Boston. They exited the cab with the promise of a piggyback ride on a bridge to the Fort Point Channel that separates South Boston from downtown. He stated that he flew into a rage and tossed the girl over a bridge into the water. Her body was found two months later at a popular beach and later ruled as an accidental cause. His worst crime was in January 28, 1966, where he burned down one of the Combat Zone's Hobo Hotels. Eleven people died in the Paramount Fire, and fifty were injured, and at that time, people blamed it on a gas leak. However, during his confession, he claimed that he wanted the pleasure of watching the building burn for shits and giggles. Lucky for Harrison, he was never indicted for the Paramount Hotel fire. Finally, this brings a total of 15 victims and Harrison's conscience was cleared. He was tried for Kenneth Martin's murder first, but his attorney claimed he was too drunk for the conviction of first degree murder. On November 18, 1970, the jury disagreed, convicting Harrison for first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. In a deal, he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for the murders of Joseph Breen, Lucy Palmerin, and Clover Parker. Harrison received three more life sentences to run concurrently with his other life sentences for the murder of Kenneth Martin. Although he was sentenced to life at Walpole State Prison, Harrison was first sent to Bridgewater State Hospital to regain a little sanity. He was in the hospital for nearly two decades, passing his time working in the hospital's kitchen. On April 21st, 1989, Harrison apparently regained his sanity and he was scheduled to return to the Massachusetts State Prison System. He didn't want to leave the asylum because it had become his home, and the day before his transfer, the giggler was found dead in his cell. Harrison had taken a lethal dose of Elevil, which is an antidepressant medication. In the end, he was a coward, taking the easy way out, ending his laughter, taking his own life, and ending his giggling ways. Number 4 Alfred J. Gaynor Alfred Gaynor was born in 1967 in Springfield, Massachusetts. Gaynor was a former repairman and crack cocaine addict working odd jobs in the 1990s. He met many of his victims when he was in search of crack cocaine. Gaynor would rob others after raping and strangling them to death. He murdered nine women from April 1995 to March 1998 in the Springfield area. Three of Gaynor's victims were found by their own children. On April 20th, 1995, Gaynor's first victim was 45-year-old Vera Hallams, who was found tied, beaten, and strangled to death in her apartment. His more prolific murder was of 20-year-old Amy Smith, who was found in her apartment on July 11th, 1996. The disturbing part of Smith's murder is that her 22-month-old daughter, Destiny Smith, died of starvation and dehydration when authorities arrived at the scene. Gaynor's last murder before his arrest was 37-year-old Joyce Dickerson P. Her body was found on March 11, 1998, outside an empty restaurant, frozen to death. Gaynor was arrested on April 10th, 1998, and never confessed to the murders during that time. He was convicted for the murders of Joanne Thomas, Loretta Daniels, Rosemary Downs, and Joyce Dickerson P. He sentenced to life in prison on May 19th, 2000, for those murders. Gaynor didn't confess to the murders until the death of his mother in 2006 because he didn't want to disappoint his mother. On April 30th, 1998, during court proceedings, he got beat up by one of his victim's kids. 
He took a lot of punches and was somehow hit with a chair before authorities stopped the fight. Ganor's art called A Righteous Man's Reward, depicting Jesus, was sold in an online auction. In the same year, Ganor tried to sell hair samples and a vampire drawing while browsing online. In 2010, Gaynor confessed to killing Vera Hallams, Jill Ermolini, Robin Atkins, and Yvette Torres for a plea deal. In this deal, his nephew Paul Fickling, who had a life sentence for the murders of Amy and Destiny Smith, pleaded guilty to manslaughter for a reduced sentence to 19 to 20 years. They took 14 years from his sentence for already served time, and Gaynor admitted to killing Smith. Number 3 the New Bedford Highway Killer New Bedford Highway Killer is an unidentified serial killer responsible for the deaths of nine women and disappearances of two or more women. They all disappeared by the New Bedford Highway in Massachusetts between July 1988 and June 1989. All the unknown killer's victims were known prostitutes and substance abusers. Even though all the killer's victims were abducted from the New Bedford area, they were all found in different towns nearby. These towns include Dartmouth, Freetown, and Westport, Massachusetts alongside Interstate 195. One of the main detectives who tried to solve this cold case was John Dexter Doerr. The first victim was considered Robin Rhodes, who was last seen in New Bedford in March or April of 1988. Unfortunately, her body was found on March 28, 1989, alongside Route 140. First person they suspected as the killer was Anthony de Grazia. In May 1989, a locally known New Bedford prostitute identified de Grazia after a picture was shown by a young and experienced detective, Lorraine Forrest, provided a picture to her of de Grazia. She described him having a flat nose, stating that she never named de Grazia as a positive suspect, but mentioned he looked like the man who assaulted her. Anthony de Grazia was later accused of 17 rapes and assaults on several prostitutes in the area. Based on all the accusations, he was taken in for questioning, arrested, and charged with those crimes. While being investigated for rapes and murders, de Grazia was a suspect for nine murders along the New Bedford highways. After being incarcerated for 15 months and 18 court appearances, de Grazia was released on bail back in January 1990. He was rearrested for shouting threats to DA Ronald Pina for wrongful imprisonment but posted bond again. Later, de Grazio was found dead under a picnic table at his girlfriend's house and ruled his death as a suicide. In August 1990, New Bedford attorney Kenneth Ponte was indicted by a grand jury for the death of Rochelle Dopierala who was beaten to death. Ponte had a history of crimes in his younger years, which consists of drug use and an earlier incident involving Dopierala. Bristol County attorney Ronald Pina believed that Ponte had killed her because she was supposedly planning to disclose his drug activities. Dopierala's mother declared that her daughter gave her phone number to Ponte in the event she needed to contact him. Ponte admitted to representing Dopierala in a case back in September 1988 and disappeared a little later after she implicated another man of raping her. Ponte moved to Port Ritchie, Florida in September 1988 and was arraigned on a single count of murder on August 17, 1990. He entered into the courtroom with a plea of not guilty and posted a $50,000 bond. Sometime in late 1990, Ponte stated in an interview with the Associated Press that having his name linked to the killings ruined his career as a lawyer and his entire life. On July 29, 1991, the district attorney dropped the murder charges against Ponte, pointing out a lack of evidence. A year later, his drug and assault charges were dropped, and the New Bedford case went cold. On January 27, 2010, Ponte was found dead in his New Bedford home and was considered the only suspect ever charged in the still unsolved two decades old highway killings case. Lisa Rowell, a spokeswoman for the Bristol County District Attorney's Office, stated in their earlier investigation showed no evidence of foul play, and the investigators do not believe his death is suspicious. Daniel Tavares Jr. was the last known assumed suspect in the New Bedford Highway killings. 
While he was in prison for the murder of his mother, Daniel sent an intimidating letter to one of the workers in the prison. In this letter, he stated he was responsible for the highway murders. Also, Daniel claimed to live in New Bedford and knew where another murdered woman was located. Her name was Gail Potello and was buried within a mile from his home. Tavares was convicted of two recent murders of Brian and Bev Muak. Adding to his death toll, he was convicted in 2015 of the murder of Gail Potello. She went missing in 1988, and her body was found under a tree in his backyard. He claims himself as the killer, but spectacles think he just wanted the spotlight and happened to kill in the same area as the unknown killer. There are many other suspected killers, and many people assigned to this case to solve this mystery, although, to this day, it remains unsolved. Number 2 The Boston Strangler From June 1962 to January 1964, 13 single women from the ages of 19 to 85 were murdered throughout the Boston area. It was believed that all the victims were women who lived alone in the Boston area. Most of the victims were sexually assaulted and strangled in their own apartments. Authorities during that time believed that one man was the perpetrator. Most of the crime scenes had no sign of forced entry into their homes, and most of the women let the killer in. The reason the assailant was let in is because people either knew him or believed that he was some type of serviceman, such as a delivery driver or a salesman. The first victim being 55-year-old Anna Sleezers, who had just finished dinner on the evening of June 14, 1962. She decided to have a quick bath before her son Juris picked her up for a memorial service that was being held in her church. As the water started running with the music of the opera coming from her gramophone, there was a knock on her door who was the Boston Strangler. When her son arrived about an hour later, he could not get inside his mother's home, so he forced the door open and found her lying dead in the bathroom. He found his mother in the bathroom with a rope from her bathrobe tied around her own neck. The attacks continued to happen despite the mass media talking about the first few murders, but that didn't slow down the unknown killer. After being blasted all over the media, many residents purchased tear gas, new locks, and deadbolts for their doors to feel safe there. Many women would move away from the area altogether because of being terrified of the killer. On October 27, 1964, a stranger entered a young woman's home located in East Cambridge, posing as a detective. He tied the victim to her bed, sexually assaulted her, and left saying, I am sorry. The woman that was raped gave a description of her attacker that led the authorities to identify the suspect as Albert DeSalvo. When his photo was published, many women who were assaulted by him identified him as the suspect. Earlier on October 27th, DeSalvo had posed as a motorist with car problems and attempted to enter a home in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. The owner of the home was future Brockton Police Chief Richard Sproles, whom had become suspicious and later fired a shotgun at DeSalvo. He was not suspected first of being involved with the string of murders. Soon after, he was charged with rape and gave a detailed confession of his activities as the Boston Strangler. He first confessed of these crimes to fellow inmate George Nazar, who reported the confession to attorney Lee Bailey. Also, Bailey took on the defense of DeSalvo, and even the authorities were impressed at the accuracy of DeSalvo's descriptions of the crime scenes. There are a few inconsistencies, but DeSalvo was able to cite details that were withheld from the public during that time. He was charged for other earlier crimes of robbery and sexual offenses because there is no physical evidence to support his claims of being the Boston Strangler. For those earlier charges, he is known as the Green Man and the Measuring Man. DeSavo's attorney, Bailey, brought up his confession about the murders as a part of DeSavo's history to the trial to gain a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict to the sexual offenses. He was sentenced to life in prison in 1967. In February of the same year, he escaped to two other inmates from the Bridgewater State Hospital and they started a full-out manhunt. A note was found in his bunk when he escaped that was addressed to the warden. 
In his note, he said he had escaped while focusing attention on the living conditions in the hospital and his own problems. He disguised himself as a U.S. Navy petty officer, third class, but turned himself in the next day after he had escaped. After his capture, he was transferred to the maximum security Walpole State Prison. Sometime in November 1973, DeSavo got a message to his doctor stating that he needed to see him urgently because he had something very crucial to say about the Boston Strangler murders. Unfortunately, on November 25th, 1973, he was found stabbed to death in the prison infirmary. From the level of the security in the prison, it was believed by many that his death was planned by employees and prisoners working together to kill him. On July 11, 2013, Boston authorities announced that DNA evidence linked DeSalvo to the rape and murder of 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, who is considered the last of the Boston Strangler's victims. DeSalvo's remains were exhumed, and the Suffolk District Attorney, Daniel F. Conley, said he expected the investigators to find an exact match with the evidence compared with his DNA. On July 19, 2013, Daniel F. Conley, Attorney General Martha Coakley, and Boston Police Commissioner Edward F. Davis announced that the DNA test results proved that DeSalvo's semen was recovered at Sullivan's 1964 murder scene. It took almost 50 years for authorities to solve the case because of evidence. Number 1 Jane Topin, aka The Nightmare Nurse Jane was born as Honora Kelly in Boston, Massachusetts sometime in 1857. She was the youngest of the four girls in a poor Irish immigrant family, and by the age of one, her mother died due to tuberculosis. Her father, Peter Kellett, who was a tailor, went insane and was rumored to have sewn his own eyelids shut. By 1863, Peter took 8-year-old Delia and 6-year-old Honora to foster care called the Boston Female Asylum in the south end side of Boston. Delia was rumored of becoming a prostitute and alcoholic. Another sister of Honora named Nellie ended up losing her mind and was sent to an insane asylum. By the age of eight, Honora was adopted by Ann Topin from the orphanage and had her name changed to Jane Topin. She is used as a servant in Ann Topin's household, located in Lowell, north of Boston. When Ann Topin died, Elizabeth took over the home and continued to treat Jane as a servant, but treated her more fairly than her mother. Elizabeth married a church deacon, Ormel Brigham, who moved into the Topin house. Unfortunately for Jane, issues arose, and these problems caused her to move out of the house that she lived in for over two decades. By the age of 33, Jane Topin began her training as a nurse at Cambridge Hospital in 1887. By that time, she got her nickname Jolly Jane for the friendly outgoing attitude. She lied about offering Tsar from a Russian nursing job and was thought of stealing small things. The hospital grew very worried about her obsession with autopsies, but they didn't know she was experimenting with morphine and atropine on her older patients. One patient named Amelia Finney had surgery performed in 1887. After the operation was done, she said Jane Topin gave her a shot of bitter medicine, causing her to lose consciousness. She then climbed into the bed with Finney and held her as she was slipping in and out of consciousness. Topin tried to give more medicine, but she refused, and then something caused her to leave in a hurry. Fortunately for Jean, Finney thought it was just a dream, but this is not the case after she was arrested 14 years later. Jean Topin got a job at a Massachusetts General Hospital, but lost it because she gave out too many opiates. Fortunately for Jean, doctors recommended her as a private nurse to wealthy clients. Nurse Jane Topin was earning $25 a week, and the other women only earned an average of $5 a week. Jane later admitted during her time there she would climb into the bed with her patients as she murdered them for a sexual thrill. Many authors think Jane started her killing spree sometime in the 1880s, and most of the victims she murdered were elderly people. She ended up befriending her elderly landlord and his wife, but she ended up killing them one by one. Some of her colleagues stated in nursing school they remembered her saying there is no use in keeping old people alive. In 1889, 70-year-old Mary McClear got very sick on a visit to Cambridge. 
Her doctor sent Jean, and she said she was one of the best nurses to take care of her, but Jean ended up poisoning her. About a month later, she killed a close friend with poison so she could take her job as a dining hall matron at St. John's Theological School in Cambridge. She got the job, but it didn't last because the administration couldn't ignore complaints about her lack of skill and other issues. Throughout Topin's nursing career, she experimented on many patients using different combinations of medicines and chemicals. She gave them different dosages each time to get their nervous systems to slide them close to death and back to life, but eventually killing them. Topin got away with a lot of deaths, especially when she entered private practice. By 1899, Topin was very careless with her murders. She poisoned her foster sister, her brother-in-law, and some of her landlords too. Jane rented a cottage in Bourne from the Davis family, but she couldn't keep up with the rent. Alden Davis's wife, Maddie, came down to Cambridge to collect money from her, but Jane killed her with a combination of morphine and atropine. She then moved in with elderly Alden Davis to take care of him, but killed him soon after. Jane then killed two of his daughters through marriage, Minnie Gibbs and lastly, Geraldine Gordon. Minnie Gibbs' father-in-law suspected foul play from the sudden deaths of the entire family because they were healthy. He got a hold of a toxicologist and got a judge to get Minnie's body exhumed. The autopsy revealed she died of morphine and atropine poisoning. Authorities soon after arrested Jane Topin on October 29, 1901. Jane Topin went to trial in the summer of 1902 for multiple counts of murder. She confessed to her lawyer, stating that she killed at least 31 victims and perhaps as many as 100 people. Jane stated if she had been a married woman, she probably wouldn't have killed all those people. She then said, I would have my husband, my children, and my home to keep her thinking about murder. The trial took place in Barnstable County Courthouse for eight hours. It took the jury 27 minutes to deliberate and found her not guilty by reason of insanity. Jane Topin spent the rest of her life at the Taunton State Hospital and died on August 17, 1938. Some of the staff there remembered her calling them into her room and gave them a menacing smile. She then would say, Get some morphine, dearie, and then we'll go out to the ward. She would lastly say, You and I will have a lot of fun seeing them die. Thank you so much for the added attention and support for our channel. I see there are those that haven't subscribed that watch our videos continuously. If you guys would like to, uh, subscribe to our video because it helps out a lot for the new algorithms. We have a Patreon we started up to support us further so we can start using better editing programs, music programs, and the necessities to further our editing work. Thank you so much guys for watching through our video and taking the time out of your day to watch what we produced. Stay tuned for the next episode as it can be in your state next. Peace out everyone.